that's okay. No problem. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon for those of you joining from far away. It's a real pleasure to have you for our Monty Hardcast conference again today. And I'm really delighted to invite someone I respect highly in our field of structural heart, who every time I hear her speak, I learn something new. And she's really become a true leader in structural heart over the last few years, probably even longer. Uh, Marta Sikas from the hospital clinic in the University of Barcelona. And we, as you guys know, tricuspid interventions has become a really important part of what we're doing now in structural heart. Um, and it's growing so quickly with multiple devices that we thought it was a good point to just take a step back and talk a little bit about how we approach these patients and think about that. And so Marta agreed to give a talk that will, I think, appeal to everybody, those of us who are doing intervention, but also the fellows who are on the call, who are doing general cardiology and will see these patients on the floor or in their practice in the future. So Marta, thank you once again so much for joining us. Thank you, Azim, for the nice introduction. I am really delighted and honored to be invited here. And indeed, uh, my background, as you know, is a cardiographist. Uh, and, and I've learned a lot from many people. And one of them was Mario Garcia in the Cleveland Clinic a long time ago. So I try to move the field of echocardiography to different scenarios, the OR, and now, of course, the cath lab. So my talk is a little bit on, on how to approach the tricuspid valve, which has been always a, 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 a forgotten valve, and, and uh, a little bit on, on trying to build, uh, let's see if it works. <laughs> Okay, what, trying to build what is what we call a systematic approach. No, so so why we need a systematic approach? Because the most important thing to treat the valve is to understand the valve. If we really don't understand what's happening on the valve, we are not going to be able to deliver a good therapy. Also, when thinking about transcatheter therapies, we need uh, an adequate visualization. It's key, as you know, for guiding transcatheter interventions, particularly TR and anuloplasty. And also, we have the fact that ECHO, particular, uh, ECHO is particularly challenging uh, in the evaluation of the tricuspid valve. And why is more challenging? First, because uh, the uh, right cavities, the, 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 the tricuspid valve, is in a more anterior position. The insonation angle of the ultrasound is not uh, direct, no shot point perpendicular on the leaflets of the tricuspid valve. Also, these are thinner leaflets and therefore are more difficult to image. Also, we have a lot uh, of uh, potential masking factors on the tricuspid valve from the left side, mitral, aortic, mechanical, or bioprosthesis, uh, bi biologic prosthesis. Also, even the interatrial septum uh, many times makes a lot of masking because particularly in these elderly patients, we have thickened interatrial septums and even some with prior interventions. Also, we have leads in the right channel numbers many times, more and more. So these are also problems for imaging the tricuspid valve. And also an anatomical problem for transcatheter that also needs to be assessed with imaging is the natural angulation that every individual has different uh, of the entry of the in the right atrium of the superior and inferior vena cava. And these are things that also are important to image uh, when we are planning some interventions. So when we assess a patient with tricuspid regurgitation, this would be kind of a little bit of the algorithm and the uh, yeah the algorithm that we need to assess uh, when we uh, are evaluating a patient with tricuspid regurgitation. We should look at the leaflet motion because it gives us an idea of uh, several things of the presence of restriction, also of the type of dysfunction that we have. We should look at the anatomy of the valve and the lesions that 
exist on the valve. If it is an organic etiology, we will find more fibrosis, calcification, thickening, even vegetations. If it is functional or secondary TR, which is most of the cases, of the cases we will have to pay attention to uh, the coaptation gap, uh, how's the leaflet motion, if they are restricted, and how restricted is this uh, leaf are these leaflet valves also of the size of the annulus. And also, finally, we will go for quantification with color, Doppler, and the quantitative methods. And finally, we will look at the hemodynamic impact of this valve dysfunction of tricuspid regurgitation by looking at the size of the right atrium, the function of the right atrium and the, uh, the right ventricle, and also, very important, the size and the function of the inferior vena cava. We don't need to, uh, we don't have to forget the potential of transthoracic cardiography. And this is where we evaluate most of our patients. They go first to the echo lab. And this is the first place where we evaluate these patients. And really, if we want to have a good interventional program, we also need to not teach, but uh, establish a common language and a common consensus with the people working at the echo lab. So there's a lot to do with transthoracic echo and a a lot to do previous to the patient comes to the cath lab. So uh, in this sense, I want to highlight some views in the transthoracic beco. And this is a, a, a view that I'm showing here, which is the long parasternal view of the right ventricle, which is not always included in all the protocols and should be included in all patients, particularly in those with tricuspid regurgitation. This view is obtained from the parasternal long axis view just by tilting a little bit anterior the probe. And here we can see very nicely the tricuspid leaflets with the anterior leaflet here. This one can be the posterior or the septal, depending on the anatomy of the patient, and is also very good to alienate for uh, Doppler uh, estimation of pulmonary artery pressure. Also, the short axis view where we have the aortic valve in the middle, and even from transthoracic, we can get a hint of a short axis view of the trans of the tricuspid valve, where we have here the aortic valve, here we will have the septal leaflet, the posterior and the anterior. So it's just a little bit of playing a little bit with the transthoracic pro. And this is very important um, to screen patients, but also sometimes helps during interventions uh, to complement the information of esophageal echocardiography. Sometimes you have doubts and transthoracic might be very, very useful. Of course, we have the right, the four chamber view in the apical uh, uh, position where we can have uh, the best quantification here of tricuspid regurgitation. Also, we can have an idea of the right atrium size and the right ventricle size and function. Don't forget the support Coastal view for two reasons, to evaluate the right ventricle and particularly to evaluate the inferior vena cava. Very important in patients with severe tricuspid regurgitation. It's a marker of the severity and of the hemodynamic impact of this regurgitation. So always these views in the transthoracic. Also, don't uh, forget 3D uh, because you can have really good images also with transthoracic cardiography and it gives you a lot of information also. As you can see here, the aortic valve is at 11 here. So we have the anteroseptal commissure here uh, with the septal, the anterior, and the posterior leaflets. And you can see nicely this gap, also the leaflet motion here, the commissures. So also try to do it because you will have lots of information and lots of surprises on how good images you can, you can get here also from transthoracic. Also important to follow a systematic uh, examination with transesophageal echocardiography. Always when you, you are evaluating patients, screening patients, also always uh, in the cath lab, but particularly when you're screening. And here we have this, what I would say, this five must. So the short axis view, the biplane, the four chamber, we will talk now more on them, the 3D, and also the bicaval to see the access if you're planning transcatheter interventions. 
must number one is the shore axis, uh, the transgastric shore axis view of the tricuspid valve. You have to go to the stomach, you have to go deep there, do most of the times a lot of anteflexion, and you can get this view of the whole uh, tricuspid valve where you can see the annulus. You can see here as an anatomical landmark, the aortic valve. Here we are at five uh, hours, let's say. So we have the anteroceptal commissure just in front of the aortic valve. It's always the same in all patients, in all individuals. And here it's the trans, uh, the interventricular septum. So we have here the septal leaflet, we have here the posterior leaflet, and we have here the anterior leaflet that probably has here another uh, uh, an indentation. Well, there are some attempts to see to see what's the classification according to the leaflets and according to the position of the anterior papillary muscle. But the important thing here is that you see uh, the leaflets that you see if there are commissures or indentations that may hinder uh, or may determine, may influence your strategy, particularly for TR, if you are planning TR. And also important here to combine with color Doppler because you see where's the location of the origin of the jet. And also that, as you know, influences your strategy, particularly for, for TR. Uh, so the second, the second important uh, view is the as the right ventricular inflow outflow view. Okay, so in this view, what we are having here is uh, like an equivalent of the shore axis view in the transthoracic that we were saying. The aortic valve is in the middle. We see here the tricuspid valve, and we see the RV inflow and also the RV outflow with the pulmonary valve here. In this view, it's an equivalent of an intercommissural view. Okay, so we are cutting here in this blue line. Okay, this cut corresponds to this square. And the yellow one corresponds to an orthogonal plane that we can uh, get from with 3D probes, okay? So what we do is a simultaneous view of two orthogonal views, one corresponding to this intercommissural and one to this, uh, let's say, four inverted four-chamber view. Here we have the right ventricle, the right atrium, the tricuspid valve. So here we are cutting in the most anterior part of the valve here, as you can see this point uh, line, close to the aortic valve. If we move this cut, this line of, uh, of cut here in the middle, you will have uh, longer leaflets, okay? And if you move it posteriorly, you will be very close to the posterior septal commissure and you will have, again, short, uh, shorter leaflets. Important views to see the length at different levels of the leaflets. Also important to combine with Doppler to see where's the origin of the jet. So in this view, okay, from the RB inflow outflow, you will have three uh, biplane blues as shown in the previous slide. And as said before, important to combine the functional anatomy that you see without flow imaging and flow imaging to see where is the origin of the jet, also which is the size uh, of the gap. So very important views. But also we have other views that give us some complementary information. This is the four chamber uh, view and the transesophageal view. We have the metaesophageal view here where we see uh, the right ventricle important always during the intervention to check pericardial effusion here and also sometimes for the, for the uh, approximation. But this is a view that we use more for a screening to look at the left of the uh, length of the leaflets uh, to, to rather than during during the intervention. Also the deep transophageal view, which is just a four chamber view that we go a little bit with retroflex of the probe and we are cutting in a most posterior part. We have here as a corner, as a anatomical landmark, the coronary sinus, okay? So we also can do the sweep posterior to anterior from the four chamber view. That it's complementary to understanding 
the functional anatomy and the dysfunction of the valve, mainly as I said before for the screening, and particularly to look at the leaflet motion, which is important to, we can use the classification of Carpentier, sorry, there is one missing type one here. So if the leaflets are, have a normal motion and it's mainly due to annular dilatation, if we have excessive motion type two, which is a prolapse, or if we have restriction of the leaflets, I'm combining here with transthoracic echo, so that can be in both systole and diastole, like in this case of carcinoid disease, or just in systole, like in this case of right ventricular dilatation and dysfunction, which is a systolic impairment in the closing of the uh, tricuspid leaflets. Also, we, it's important to look at the surface of cooptation. In a normal tricuspid valve, leaflets are touching one to the other, and this is why the valve is competent. Normally, this surface of cooptation in the tricuspid valve is five to six millimeters. With progressive tricuspid regurgitation and tricuspid valve dysfunction, this surface of cooptation is lost. So we go to, to just kissing by the tips leaflets, and then we go to real restriction and visible gap, okay? But we have to keep in mind that when this surface of cooptation is less than three millimeters, there might be significant tricuspid regurgitation. And this is important as we will see later on because color Doppler is, uh, shows something that is load dependent and particularly in the tricuspid valve, if we only rely on color Doppler, uh, our, uh, we may have infra underestimation of tricuspid regurgitation. Um, uh, well, we have gone through this, uh, how, how we measure the gap, okay? We can measure the gap, the maximum gap by sweeping the valve anteriorly to posterior direction in these three biplane views, okay? We can measure here, as you can see, there's a nice central gap in this, in this tricuspid valve. We also, and this is typically how we measure, can measure in the tricuspid, in the shore axis view, but then we have to be absolutely sure that we are cutting the tricuspid, uh, sorry, the transgastric shore axis really at the tip of the leaflets and really parallel to the orifice, okay? So for that, I, I always uh, recommend to use a biplane view where we know that exactly our shore axis view is in the adequate direction and position. Also, we can use 3D echocardiography if it is difficult to align. So apart from the shore axis, the biplane view, uh, uh, measuring the gap, we can also use uh, multiplanar reconstructions from 3D echocardiography where we can really align uh, when, wherever, whenever, wherever in the space where we want and we can get a real shore axis. In most of the patients, doing a, shore, a, a biplane shore axis is enough, but in some patients, it might be difficult to align and then we need to go to multiplanar reconstructions. Once we've seen uh, how's the motion of the leaflets, what is the valve dysfunction, we've seen the anatomy of the valve, we, ca we have seen uh, the commissures, the indentations, the origin of the jet, and then we have seen what are the lesions that are in the valve, if there is annular dilatation, if there is organic involvement of the leaflets, we can classify the etiology of this tricuspid regurgitation. And that's also important. And we are using now our uh, proposed uh, etiology classification, which is functional with the distinction of atrial and ventricular. Also those patients very more, more, more unfrequent, which are the patients with primary or organic disease of the tricuspid uh, regurgitation, and also those increasingly uh, frequent patients with uh, TR related to the presence uh, uh, of uh, intracardiac uh, leads also. Important the differentiation between atrial uh, and ventricular functional TR. Atrial is defined by uh, a predominant atrial dilatation with more normal right ventricle, where the predominant lesion is annular dilatation, okay, of the tricuspid annulus. And while on the other hand, ventricular secondary tricuspid regurgitation is more related. Of course, there is atrial dilatation because there is uh, tricuspid regurgitation 
inflammation and right ventricular dysfunction, but the predominant origin of that is right ventricular dysfunction and the, right, and the predominant lesion is uh, tethering of the leaflets and uh, increased tenting volume. And this is important because prognosis of these patients is different as shown by different authors with atrial secondary TR having better prognosis, and, but also the approach for interventional uh, might be different in terms of timing, but also in terms of the therapy or the device or the procedure that we are going to choose because the type of the dysfunction or the lesion underlying is different. One, more annular dilatation, the other more tethering of the leaflets. Also, a specific uh, chapter for CID uh, associated or related uh, tricuspid regurgitation, the importance of imaging and particularly echocardiography, also CT showing some promise in this sense to understand what's the involvement of the lead in the production of the tricuspid regurgitation or not. For example, let me show you these two cases where we have two patients with severe tricuspid regurgitation that uh, uh, have leads. This patient had a central origin, uh, as you can see here, of the tricuspid regurgitation, was wearing a pacemaker, but as you can see, the lead was here, very steady uh, in the posteroceptal or so probably this lead has nothing to do with the tricuspid regurgitation. While on the other hand, we have this patient with the lead here impinged on the septal leaflet. And as you can see here, the leaflet cannot close because the, the, the lead is impeding that. So that's related or associated with uh, lead adherence and it's a complete ter different therapy strategy for this one as compared to that one. We are using now, uh, let's move to quantification. Uh, in most uh, of the cases, when we are screening patients, I mean, when we are evaluating patients, the current recommendations, at least here in Europe, are to use the three scale degree um, classification of tricuspid regurgitation. But when we are planning intervention and when we are screening patients uh, for transcatheter interventions, we acknowledge the differentiation between severe, massive, and torrential. Of course, this is related to prognosis. Of course, there are several uh, studies showing that. And of course, the more TR you have, the worse prognosis you have, okay? But this is a classification particularly made for patients undergoing transcatheter interventions. And we acknowledge the importance of, of, of this extended classification of severe tr tricuspid regurgitation. This is another study showing, of course, that there is a threshold probably lower than expected, below 30 millimeters a square of regurgitant orifice. And from there, there is an increase uh, in, in worse prognosis. Of course, the more you have, the worst prognosis uh, is of these patients. Keep in mind only that only trusting in color Doppler might be cumbersome. We always say that the best therapy for tricuspid regurgitation is anesthesia. This is the typical example that all of us, I'm sure that have uh, witnessed that you have a patient that is awake, you see him or her in the echo lab uh, before in uh, sedation and you see this severe tricuspid regurgitation and then you go to the cath lab and you put under anesthesia and then the tricuspid regurgitation almost disappears. And this is something that also happens on the left side, heart valves, but it's more pronounced in, for tricuspid regurgitation because the right ventricle is a volume chamber and load dependent is even more uh, important. This is the important. This is important to acknowledge, and this is why we also insist in quantifying um, these patients. Uh, the Bina contracta and the PISA method are the most accepted methods. I'm not going to stand into this for time reasons, but just doing a vena contracta is something very simple. You just need to look at the narrowest part of the regurgitant uh, jet, and you have the vena contraction, me vena contracta measurement. Uh, also, you can use multiplanar reconstructions from 3D uh, color Doppler images. We have enough quality images now with current systems to do this. So in these cases that we have doubts, 
Remember that you can use that even with transthoracic radiography to have a more uh, a better quantification of tricuspid regurgitation. Then we have to evaluate the hemodynamic impact of this tricuspid regurgitation. And of course, we have echocardiogra improved echocardiographic methods. Uh, we have uh, improved techniques for myocardial deformation, strain, also 3D echocardiography in transthoracic echocardiography has shown a lot of improvements and particularly tools to do it more automatized and easier to do so. Let's implement them. And also in these patients, probably in those who are planning for intervention and that we are deciding the patient should undergo not intervention, we should do also cardiac magnetic resonance, which for the time being is the gold standard for uh, evaluating right ventricular function. We still uh, need to learn more on what are the cutoffs for indicating intervention, but we are on the way of learning that. Finally, uh, if we are uh, approaching intervention and we are, we are thinking of other transcatheter therapies, uh, multi uh, cardiac CT becomes a must, okay? It will depend on the intervention that we are planning. Each intervention has a specific criteria, but when we are planning, uh, for example, annuloplasty, percutaneous annuloplasty, we look for the sizing of the annulus, we look for the uh, proximity of the right coronary artery. And if we are planning transcatheter valve replacement, uh, 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 um, orthotopic, sorry, on the tricuspid valve, we plan, we look for the size the size of the annulus. We look also for the size of the, um, of the atria and also the entrance of the IV uh, inferior vena clava to plan the trajectory of these devices, which still have uh, large friends. Also, if we are planning bicarbonate implants, we need to look for the size also of the bike of the inferior and the superior cava. So it depends a little bit on the institutions. Uh, we are uh, here in, Euro in, in our center and in Europe, we have, as you know, uh, approved um, for therapy cardioban and as a percutaneous annuloplasty. And in most of our patients, we do, uh, when we screen for transcatheter interventions, we do always in all of them, transesophageal echo and also uh, CT. But depending on a little bit on the centers, the algorithm is, has to be uh, established. So finally, what should we expect in an echo report or in an imaging report in a patient uh, with tricuspid regurgitation? And for those who are devoted to imaging, what, what I recommend uh, to, to report in an, echo, uh, uh, in an echo or in any multimodality uh, imaging report? First of all, quantification of the disease, so quantification of tricuspid regurgitation, the hemodynamic impact of this, right ventricular uh, size and function, right atrial size, and also the inferior vena cava. And most importantly, and I think this is what is lacking in most of our uh, reports, understanding the valve dysfunction, describing the type, the, me the mechanism underlying this valve dysfunction. So which type of dysfunction we have, which lesions we have, and from that describe what we think is the etiology of that disease. If we are planning intervention, then the, the report has to, uh, has, has to include a specific features for each procedure. So if we are planning TR, we need to report the gap size, the leaflet motion and length, the presence of indentations and commissure in the tricuspid valve. If we are planning transcatheter valve replacement, the annulus side, the angulation of the uh, vena cava and the size of the right atrium also. Sorry, this is not uh, panuloplasty, this is percutaneous annuloplasty. For that, we should report the annulus side, the proximity of the right coronary artery, and for those patients plan uh, for uh, V-cava uh, valve implant, uh, the size of both vena cava. Very important, always particularly with ECHO, this is not an easy valve, for sure, always uh, look for the best image quality. And you have something to play. I mean, in the echo machine, we have bottoms to improve a little bit the echo uh, quality. You have to take your time and you 
have to work with very tiny movements. This happens always in echo, but particularly because of the, its difficulty, the tricuspid valve is even more challenging and you need to play with the small things, with tiny movements and even a small changes with the machine settings make some difference. So for example, this is the same patient exactly at the same moment. And if you look here, we don't see the septal leaflet here. There's a little bit of improvement and definitely here we see a little bit better. Of course, if you have a bad image, you don't convert that in a perfect image, but at least enough image quality to do the procedure and or to see if the leaflet, uh, the septal leaflet is restricted as, as it is here and that's just by little changes in the in the machine settings for example here what we did we changed a little bit the frequency of the transducer just small changes and there is no one single rule for everyone you have to play a little bit it's like making paella like cooking you you the the amount of salt you put it uh, it's it's just uh, an essay so finally what do we need to get for that that's uh, my my last slide so Definitely, we need two important things. We need training because sometimes these things require training to really understand the valve, to really master its analysis. And then we need another second, very important, which is a common language in the team. I'm sure in your cath lab, uh, you have a good team and, and a good uh, language with all your imagers, but this is unfortunately not, not always the case everywhere. And this is uh, the way to go to understand each other that we are looking at the same thing and talking into the same language. So that's my last slide. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if you have ha uh, questions, I'll be happy to answer now. And if not, you can also email me. Thank you very much. Marta, thank you. That was a phenomenal talk. Um, I learned so much, but it also made me hungry talking about paella. <laughs> it, makes me, it makes me miss uh, Spain <laughs> and coming to visit you. Um, anyway, um, you see Edwin has joined too. Um, Hi, Edwin. So How are you? I'll, I'll let Edwin and maybe Florian start with a question and then we'll pass it on to the fellows. And at this time, I have maybe a couple of questions. Go ahead, Edwin. Sure. Thanks, Marta. That was a really great talk. A great overview over really kind of everything with tricuspid imaging. So just amazing. Thank you. Thank um, you. I, I particularly like actually your point about, um, you know, what we should include in the report, because I think, you know, as an imaging community, it is important, I think, for us to push beyond just saying severe TR and kind of just leaving it at that, um, because there's so many more details that we actually have on the imaging. Um, I wanted to bring up, I guess, a question about the CIED related TR. As you know, we see a lot of patients who happen to have leads and you showed great examples in the transgastric imaging about how we can tell in some situations, you know, clearly if it's the lead that's causing it or if clearly the lead is a bystander. Are there other views or modalities that you use in more sort of intermediate situations when it's a little bit less clear on that view? Well, we usually we use all the views, okay? And I think that's that's the strength of having a systematic view. I mean, even if I always tell our fellows, even if you see it in one plane, I remember one of my teachers told me, you have to confirm this finding in all the views. And I think that's useful. So I like very much uh, the, the transgastric view, but also combining with a long axis view. So let's call it the biplane from the short axis, and then you get the, the long axis, no? Uh, because in many cases, you can see the, all the length of the lead, and you can see the trajectory. And that's for me is very helpful. Also very useful, at least in my experience, the deep transophageal, when you see the posterior, the, the coronary sinus, because you are very posterior and most of the leads usually are there. So for me, that's useful. But I would encourage to do all the views. I mean, once you're trained and you're quick, I mean, it doesn't take so much. So so I think it's good to follow this checklist. No, It's like when you go to the OR, they have their checklist. We should also have our checklist. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, I agree. Thank you. And and maybe to add to that, I think also if you take a, a focused 3D volume of the lead and its course through the ventricle, very like as small as possible, you have all the interactions with the um, leaflets, and you can later on, even if you miss to take the right views during the the, the examination, 
you can then go and with multiplanar construction actually reconstruct the, right. the image. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> I have one one question regarding your the beautiful 3D that you that you showed in in this presentation, and um, like and the, the value of CT and 3D echo um, in our planning and, and screening attempts. When do you think will we be able to um, do this? Most of the also the replacement and the annual plasty with um, echo 3D only without CT. <laughs> what has to happen? Yeah. And and when do you think are we there? Well, uh, I still think that we need time. But also, my doubt is the entrance of the vena, of the vena cava. Maybe for anuloplasty, that's not so important. But for transcatheter valve, I think it will take a while. And I think that all the spatial resolution um, for these structures that we have with CT are going to be difficult with 3D echo for the time, at least for the upcoming five years, because we need a very big sector to do that. So, because these are dilated right atrium. So I'm not so sure that this will be substituted by 3D echo. Maybe measuring the annulus, yes, I agree, mm -hmm. but... The other thing, I'm not sure. And also for percutaneous anuloplasty, you need to see the right coronary artery uh, proximity. So uh, unless we are convinced that even if you hinge it, it doesn't matter, no? But <laughs> so I think we still need CT and I am a strong believer on the complementary of multimodality. So I'm sorry, but I think we need CT <laughs> for the time being. <laughs> Except it. Except what do you think? No, I think <laughs> we all agree. But I mean, the one limitation we sometimes have is a lot of tricuspid patients also have renal insufficiency and have low yeah. GFRs. And so we, like you, if a patient's GFR is normal, we do CT on everybody, right? MTE and a left and right heart cath, because then we can decide on all the options available for the tricuspid. But, but once the GFR is sitting now at like 35, 40, um, I become more concerned about doing the CT. And so I think, you know, I would love to see some data about, I mean, so Edwin will spend a lot of time. He'll do all the annular measurements on 3D and we'll use that to try and make a decision. Should we, is this in size for a valve? Should we take the risk of putting, of doing the CT? I, will, I don't know, maybe there is data. Are there data comparing annular dimensions on TEE versus CT for the tricuspid? I think that 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 is that is going to need to happen. I, I know that there are some uh, groups working on that. Um, it, it seems to be, so there, there's only one imaging vendor currently that has an automatic tricuspid annulus program. Um, so GE has this, 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 I think what automates the process and which allows yeah. you to get to um, a, a, like a comparable measurement. Right. Whereas on the Philips card, you don't have that yet. You okay. can, you can um, repurpose the mitral valve version, but it's you know it's not as intuitive. So I think that is a, a prerequisite to mm -hmm. to really be able to compare. Yeah. I think it's a, something important for the field to to go after. Um, yeah. Yeah. Any thoughts, I, I, Martha? I, 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 I don't I don't anticipate the measurement of the annulus will be a big problem with 3D because, for example, we are doing cardiovans since two years ago, and we've learned a lot to measure the annulus with echo because this is what we do during the procedure, no? But uh, the problem, um, I'll start to, to get MPR images and, and try to explore the right coronary. Maybe maybe that's the revival for contrast echo. Who knows? <laughs> Let's try it. <laughs> Let's so, try it. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but, but I think we do need the data, right? Just say there's a 10% difference or there's minimal difference. Because, I mean, one of the things I remember with Tava in the old days you know, they did these TE measurements versus CT, and we would show the TE undersizes. I honestly don't think that's valid today anymore, because when I see how you guys now measure today compared to seven, eight years ago, the aortic annulus, which is a little bit easier to measure, and using 3D, the, the difference of 10% undersizing is becoming less and less. So I think, you know, I mean, you, echo is just becoming so much better at doing the dimensions. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so we have some of the fellows who've raised their hands and have some questions. Guillem, why don't you start? Yeah, hi. Thank you for, for your lecture. Hi, very, very, very nice. I just have a few questions about the, you know, the multi-parameter evaluation of the RV. So between the all different markers, 
by example, for the 2D methods like uh, TAPSI, uh, systolic annular velocity, or, or fractional area change, you know, you have uh, sometimes all of these parameters are not in agreement. And with the 3D measurements, with the strain, with the reserve, also, and also with the last, you know, RVAP coupling, it's very hard to, to find where is the, the good and the wrong spots. So can you maybe try to give us your hierarchy between all of these parameters <laughs> and how you define a, a good spot? Because I think yeah. it's now the whole question we have when we try to do this uh, evaluation. And sorry, <laughs> maybe for this very large uh, question. No, no, no. I think this question, it's very good. And indeed, we, we are on the way of finding an answer. I think for the time being, the evaluation of right ventricle has to be done with cardiac MR. This is my personal opinion. And unfortunately, we only have ejection fraction at this time be at uh, this time point okay uh, but the only reliable really reliable in the three uh, it's the it's the the dmr because we see adequately the endocardial border which is not always the case with echo if we have good image 3d echo i think it's useful also uh transthoracic 3d echo uh, to evaluate ejection fraction. The problem is that we don't have much data on the uh, outcome uh, based on this parameter, okay? We have for tautology of a lot, I think, from some congenital disease, but we don't know which is really the right spot and we just rely on what we know from uh, the left heart side, okay? So we need really prognostic studies from saying, okay, which is the right spot? I think treatments are going to be quicker <laughs> and they are going to be so low risk that we will do them before we know this cutoff or this right spot, okay? But when we have doubts, we go for cardiac MR. I think that currently that's the gold standard. There is uh, also, I believe, on the complementary role of strain imaging uh, with ECHO, uh, because it gives you a complementary, particularly if you combine it with size uh, of the right ventricle, it gives you a, a little bit more of an idea of what's the right ventricular function, and if it is impaired, yes or no, okay? Uh, regarding annular parameters, uh, I'm not so fan of them, okay? Particularly in, in volume overload. If you have uh, tricusp severe tricuspid regurgitation, the annulus is always moving, no? Uh, so, so I'm not so big fan. And I think they are late markers. When your tapsy goes down, your right ventricle is almost dead. So that's my personal opinion. So... Uh, also, there are very, very um, interesting work that I'm looking forward to see uh, the results, to seeing the results on, on stress, uh, MR. I mean, there were some work in a uh, long time ago with the stress uh, MR, uh, the butamine MR, to evaluate the contractile reserve of, right, of the right ventricle. That might be interesting. Uh, and maybe we can learn a little bit more on the with the contractile reserve evaluation but i really don't we really don't know we really don't know i mean for mr uh we, for primary mr we use uh, some cutoffs with more or less some evidence but secondary mr and secondary tr which is most of the times the issue we have no clue we have no clue on the on the right spot and on the potential to recover of the right ventricle that's that's the reality so uh, my, my opinion, MR, uh, one, uh, because it gives you ejection fraction. It also may give you fibrosis. So that's another idea of if it will recover and if there is still something to do or not. And maybe in the future we do contractile reserve with the butamine, whatever, the butamine echo, the butamine MR, whatever you want. <laughs> I think MR has the complementary information of fibrosis and tissue characterization. I think that's important. Right. Complex. I think it's a, it's a complex yeah. problem. Um, Julio. Uh, good morning. Hi, uh, Dr. Asiyes. Thank you for this wonderful talk. Uh, I have a couple of questions. The first one uh, is, um, do you use or what do you think about the right ventricular myocardial performance in the right ventricle? 
and a right edge of strain as well because it's not uh, used uh, frequently. And the second one is, do uh, you use in your patients in your uh, daily uh, practice uh, the Vexus score volume sex ultrasound with uh, regarding the uh, how is the volume in the inferior vein, cava, suprahepatic vein, porta vein, and renal vein? Yes, we we try not to make it uh, very complex. Uh, RV strain, I already answered. Yes, we use RV strain, but uh, again, we there are no cutoffs because the 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 value of the uh, of the right ventricular strain will also depend on the size of the cavity. So I think that the answer that we all want: what is the threshold? I mean. It doesn't exist. I think, unfortunately, <laughs> we just need to make a combination of several parameters. And this is why phenotyping these patients will, in the future, help us so much, I think. Uh, regarding the right ventricular performance index, um, our experience is not good with this index. We are not very believers on it, so we don't use it. And then the third one, we use the vena cava. I think I, uh, I highlighted that in my presentation, but we don't use sophisticated indexes. We are very simple people. <laughs> we look, we look, we look. <laughs> Don't worry, we like simple too. We like simple too, <laughs> uh, we, we, we use the, the size mm -hmm. and also the collapsibility of the, of the, and that's something that we also have learned with TR. I mean, you have a, a patient with severe TR, uh, tricuspid regurgitation, you put a, a clip and you have a nice reduction and the next day your vena cava size is reduced and in one month it starts not to collapse, but it starts to move. So we really believe on that. It's qualitative, but it works. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, just before we go to Andrea, if any of the Moses or Weiler fellows, general fellows have a question, please just raise your hand. We can allow you to ask the question. Uh, but it's a great opportunity to ask Dr. Sikas any of your, your dying questions about tricuspid. Um, Andrea. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for this great lecture. Um, my question is about CID related TR because there is even more awareness of this etiology. And I wonder if you were ever asked to guide another kind of intervention like repositioning of a lid. And if we should systematically check where a right ventricular lid is implanted and if needed, move it sooner there rather than later. Yeah, uh, we have uh, been guiding repositioning of leads, yes, in one patient that had an acute TR, let's say after that, and then we try to guide uh, the repositioning, we've done that. Uh, the question, the second question, if we should guide all the implant of pacemakers, well, I'm not sure we can make it. <laughs> we will need some robots. We will need some robots <laughs> that help us. Uh, and we need to learn a little bit before answering that question. I mean, some people advocate for that, but I'm not really sure that we should advocate for that with the knowledge that we have. I mean, there's millions of pacemakers implanted every day in the world. Uh, not all of them induce TR. Uh, even mm, not all of them induce heart failure. Um, and the mechanism uh, of inducing even heart failure, which is even more frequent than TR, induced by my pacemakers are several. It's not always interfere, interfere of the lead with the tricuspid valve. Sometimes it's induce, inducing the synchrony, et cetera. So I'm not sure we need to guide all these patients during implantation. Probably what we need to do first is to be aware of this disease and to look at patients <laughs> after an implant of pacemaker. I mean, after an implant, I'm saying one month after or one year after, particularly if they are symptomatic. We need to think on this. I'm not sure we're ready to do this in all implant uh, of pacemakers. So may maybe we can say it, but are we really able to implement that? Not sure. That's my thinking. And this is mm -hmm. uh, controversial. I don't know what you think, uh, Edwin. No, I, don't. <laughs> I agree. I'm not sure. There's so many pacemakers that happen. I mean, ideally, we'd love to be able to know that they're being implanted without causing TR. But I don't think that's going to be possible. And I also think, you know, 
when it's implanted at baseline with the patient lying flat, uh, may not be reflective of what that leads going to look like a few days later after it's kind of settled in and and the patient's moving around. So I don't know uh, what you guys thought. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I think it's a little premature to just say, you know, we have yeah. to do this for everyone and that we know for sure it's going to prevent all these pacemaker issues. Yeah. Uh, but I do wonder, you know, should we be thinking that, you know, anybody who gets a, a lead across their tricuspid should a few months after that get an echo? Because if you start to see lead impingement, moving a fresh lead is much easier than moving a lead that's been in there for like 10 years or removing it even and putting it somewhere else. So I don't know, maybe there's, you know, as we think about this, uh, we should think about it. The problem is we don't even know. I don't know. I don't know if any of you know, what's the incidence of lead related TR? We don't know. We have no idea. So, I mean, maybe even only like 1%, I mean, or less. And if you think how many, how many leads are being put in across the right ventricle, the amount of extra echoes you guys are going to be, be having to do a report <laughs> is a lot. <laughs> It's a lot, absolutely. This is the, the way I think we need to learn. I mean, learning a little bit on from these small series or big, even bigger registries to learn the predictors, no, of which patients is at higher risk and maybe focus on that, no. Yeah. But it's like TAVI, no. At the beginning, we were doing echo in all TAVI procedures. Now we don't do. I mean, we go for the risk ones, the ones that need basilica, whatever, no. Yeah. Um, I don't know if we should do this way or if we should first learn because this is already a procedure that is implanted. No, no. Tabby, right. we started with echo and we abandoned echo. The <laughs> but we started Tabby now. Pacemakers, yeah. it's it's huge. We cannot make it. <laughs> I agree. I agree. So I have two more questions and maybe I'll, uh, for all three of you. Uh, and maybe you each can give me your, your thoughts. So the first question is, what do you see five to 10 years from now? Um, two questions are going to sound very similar. I apologize. What do you think the role of AI is going to be in echocardiography in five to 10 years from now? Maybe start with you, Mark. I, I think it's going to be a lot. Already, we, we already have a lot of artificial intelligence in the echo machines. Uh, a lot. I mean, machines are uh, getting better images with artificial intelligence. They are getting immediate automatized uh, um, measurements with artificial intelligence. This is already there. We wish one day they will make uh, an automatic report. We wish. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's closer. It's getting closer. Know. If you just Could... ask Chat GPT to like report it for you, I'm sure that no, 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 but <laughs> it's not, it's, it's not far away i think of course su supervise of course yeah. super it has to be supervised uh and definitely i think artificial intelligence will have a super role in phenotyping patients not only from echo images which is for sure but also on clinical features and there are i i think it was two weeks ago there were two papers uh uh, at the same issue, I think it was European Journal on artificial intelligence, on on the LA shape, on the T, on TR, mitral TR. I mean, I think there are so. I mean, this is so complex. There are so many parameters influencing that probably uh, the the way of putting thresholds like yes and no, it's not going to work. So right. we have to put many things, and our brain is is very good, but it's limited. So we. <laughs> may be there to supervise and, and give the common sense that probably a machine or the clinical sense, but let's give the mathematics to the machine. So I'm sure it will have a role. Edwin? Yeah, I agree with that. I think it's going to be huge because I think a lot of the things we already do in imaging, especially with optimization, you know, a lot of things intra-procedural, they're, they're already a little bit algorithmic, they're a little bit pattern recognition, which often mm -hmm. lends itself really well to you know, then training a machine model and, and sort of what to look for, and what to do. Um, I also agree with Marta on what, what she's saying in terms of a lot of the predictive models too, because in echocardiography, we take a lot of raw data from the machine. It gets distilled down into really 2D image so that then we can interpret and process. But there's probably a lot that gets lost from that raw data transformation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where there's potentially a lot of power uh, okay. in terms of it. AI in the future, once you have a big enough data set. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think in, in contrast to, to CT, uh, ECHO is incredibly um, operator dependent, right? There's uh, like experience plays such a big role. Mm -hmm. Now, if you imagine to feed AI with enough data, there's a, a like a base intelligence in the machine that will help you get the right views, get the, to the right landmarks, um, automate all of these things that people need to learn over years um, automatically. So I think there's play, play a huge role. Right, right. Before I ask you my last question, Question, Marta. Uh, there are lots of people saying hello to you. Uh, yeah. So Dr. Skinone let, says hello. Let, let me let me answer. Hola, Aldo, and also hola, Mario. <laughs> uh, nice talking to you, Mario. Always uh, on the wire. And Mario is asking a question on on my best for estimating our SVP in severe TR. Any tricks? Uh, no trick. I mean, uh, of course, indirect signs, as you know, of pulmonary hypertension, but mainly right calf. This is what we do. Um, learning a little bit from the work of Ana Garcia that you also uh, know very well from cardiac MR and trying to estimate, but in the end, particularly if we're planning intervention, right calf. This is what we do. Right, okay. okay. Um, so my last question for the three of you is, again, five to ten years, uh, what do you see the role of 4D ice catheters playing in tricuspid interventions? Marta? Well, uh, <laughs> I'm not the best defender of ice. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's why we want you to no. say. If you think no, you can, please. You, 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 can, you, you can't favorite. record that, eh? Maybe in 10 years and that. <laughs> no, I met I met somebody who said TE is not going to work. And you see, I mean, <laughs> so maybe I, I hope I have best prediction. I mean, it has pros and cons, but first, it's very expensive. Second, uh, I don't have experience with 4D ice. So this is my disclosure, but I have experience with 2D eyes. Uh, and I think it's another tool to have it there, but I don't think it's going to be the solution because it's very unstable. And particularly with severe TR patients, I mean, it's moving all around. And also you have uh, other leads there, other catheters. So there's no much, there's too much people in the right atrium. So for tricuspid, I am a little bit, Okay. Uh, skeptical. I have asked uh, to try it. I mean, maybe I'm convinced, <laughs> but this is my opinion. Well, for someone who likes cardio bed, I think you should try it when it becomes available in the US. But mm. well, don't let, I'm sorry, in Europe, don't let Marta dissuade you from saying what you're going to say, Edwin and, and Florian. <laughs> I, I mean, we obviously have already seen a huge potential um, for it in tricuspid in particular. Um, I think the whole community is learning. I agree cost is a huge barrier, mm -hmm. but I do think that, you know, with more standardization, more experience, the technology will also keep evolving. Um, I think it's going to play a massive role okay. uh, just because of a lot of the challenges that were highlighted with TE and, and the nature of these patients too. Okay. 10 years, you think? Yeah, 10 years. I, I, I'll take like the most extreme. And okay. I, 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 I really believe in it. I think that looking at the speed of how the field is developing the last four years, Yeah. I think in 10 years, we'll have 80% of the patients treated in conscious sedation on the right side with ice only. Wow. I love this. Okay. Yeah. Great discussion. That, that, that's, that's, <laughs> that's my goal also, but I prefer a micro T in the esophagus, not to interfere with the others. So let's see. <laughs> <laughs> oh I think yeah, definitely um, our goal is conscious sedation. Right. Absolutely. And right. and we've been doing that already with micro TE with for some procedures, not for cardiovan, definitely. <laughs> but <laughs> LAO closure, you know, I mean, we are doing these things and it's working. So yeah. let's see if yeah. the intra intracardiac or micro TE, but definitely <laughs> conscious sedation. We agree on that. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Mario, maybe the final comment from you. I see you're able to join from Denver and then we'll close. Yeah, ah, I'm sorry. Is. It's very early here in Amber. And oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was until until very late last night with uh, with your friends, uh, Jim Thomas and Alan Klein. Oh. And <laughs> with uh, Dr. Latips and Dr. Um, Ho's friend, uh, Linda. <laughs> so, um, so Good. But, but I will tell you uh, one, one comment. Uh, we, we, we're actually putting together the, the next exam of the ASC. And there are no questions about Recospi, but we don't want to touch that. <laughs> 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 with a temple pole.
<laughs> Although I have to say, I refer a patient to these guys uh, last week, so we'll see what happens. Yeah, you, you refer more than one to us, so I think you believe it's no longer yeah. a forgotten vow. <laughs> anyway, absolutely. Listen, Marta, thanks, Mario. Mario. Thanks for joining. Uh, it's always good to see you, Marta. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. <laughs> what a great talk and what a great morning. We appreciate everybody's joining in the lively discussion. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and for all the questions. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. <laughs>